I'm Jess Lenore for The Real News Network. It was scenes of panic as passengers fled through dust and debris ensued after a double bomb attack at Brussels Airport on Tuesday. Passengers described the moments after the attack, part of two attacks in the Belgian capital which left at least 34 people dead. I just went to the toilet and then like after five minutes I, I heard an explosion and all the ceilings is going down and then I, I just go under the sink and then the second explosion went and then everything is black. And I see, when I go out, I see all the, uh, a lot of people with uh, blood and I just go, just, just run out of the airport. Yeah, and all the building there is like, it's like a chaos there. What was you feeling at that moment? I'm so scared. I feel like it's the end of the world. <laughs> Brussels Airport said it canceled all flights and the complex had been evacuated and trains to the airport had been stopped. Passengers were taken to coaches from the terminal that would remove them to a secure area. Just minutes before the interview of the Islamic State claimed responsibility for both attacks. And police are seeking help identifying at least one potential suspect. Well now joining us from Paris, France to discuss this is John Brumont. John is the author of Humanitarian Imperialism, Using Human Rights to Sell War. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. So you're joining us from Paris today, but you're based in Brussels. Many are asking why Brussels? The, the blast today occurred just four days after the arrests in Brussels of a suspected participant in November militant attacks in Paris that killed 130 people. Well, I don't know if it has anything to do because they probably have planned these things in advance. And don't forget that the guy was arrested and somehow defected. So I don't know if there is any direct link, but of course Brussels is the capital of Europe. That's where the, the, the attack was very close to the European Parliament and European institutions. And also, uh, you know, uh, the airport is of course international. There are uh, American businesses there. I mean, it's a symbolic attack like the 9-11 one. I mean, uh, I surprised like, to attack and the Belgian government was warned for uh, some time that there would be attacks. So I'm not sure it's linked to this arrest this recent arrest, but of course I don't know. This is for the police to say. I'm not interested so much in that, but rather in the uh, deep roots of the conflict that there is between us and the people who attack us. And so are people in Europe connecting the dots uh, between Western policy in the Middle East, um, which helps sort of create the conditions for this type of extremism? Um, for these types I, of I, Yeah, I think it, it depends. I don't think there is much, you know, people who are interested in politics and getting their news outside of the mainstream media connect the dot. But of course, the mainstream media don't connect the dot very much. But you see, the dots are very complicated because the people who are attacking us are people whom we have actually helped in Libya and Syria. Okay, the, the foreign minister of France, Fabius, has said that you know, Al Nostra was doing a good job in Syria by fighting Assad. We have been using these people to attack governments that we did not like, but that had done absolutely nothing to us. The government of Syria has expressed its sympathies uh, for the victims in Brussels. And they have said repeatedly that if we play with terrorists, they are, that's going to backfire and that's going to come on us now. And we did not listen to them. Uh, they were willing to give us, uh, to the French government, for example, names of uh, French terrorists in Syria and the French government declined to have this uh, list because they didn't want to collaborate with the Syrian government. I mean, at some point, you see, there's a, a sort of an alliance, a strange alliance between the neoconservative and the human rights people who, in the name of human rights, want to wage war on certain governments. But of course, it's very selective. They say they want to protect people in Benghazi, but they never protected people in Syria, in Libya, which was destroyed by NATO. They have not protected the civilians who have been killed and fled uh, from the terrorists in Libya. They are not protecting the people in Bahrain. They are not protecting the people in Yemen. It's extremely selective. But nevertheless, this is, has been our policy. But the policy backfires just the same way the Taliban. You see, the, the Americans supported the ancestor of the Taliban in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. And then it led eventually to Al-Qaeda in 9-11. Uh, you see, policies backfire. I mean, if you go before the war, the, before World War II, there was a lot of sympathy for, um, you know, for uh, Hitler in his fight against communism. And when uh, eventually when there was the war with the Soviet Union, they had to ally with the Soviet Union against Hitler. 
and then they, you know, they became enemies of the Soviet Union after the war. I mean, these alliances are, you know, very, I mean, when you ally yourself with people who are not real allies, like the terror of the Islamists in the Islamic world, uh, in order to overthrow secular governments, which are viewed as hostile to us or hostile to Israel, then you, you can have backlashes that are totally unexpected. But I think it's not only the invasion of Iraq, it's also the policy afterwards. It's not just the, I mean, the policy has been very complicated. We have helped Islamists and we have fought, fought, fought Islamists. The problem is that the only people who would actually be on our side and actually fighting this terrorist are the government of Syria, of Iran, and the Hezbollah, and of course Russia to some extent, and we don't want to talk to them. I mean, that seems to be absurd. And, and eventually, I think we are going to change our policies because we have to. I mean, you know, people will realize that our policy is totally suicidal. Yes, yeah, so, so you're saying essentially the U.S. and the West are supporting chaos, supporting regimes um, that oppress their own people as well. well that, no, it's not just that. They're also supporting regime change. But the problem, I mean, this business about regime that oppress their own people is complicated. Mm -hmm. They support them sometimes. Sometimes they use this argument in order to overthrow them. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that. But the backfire, I mean, it seems to me that one has to come back to a more realistic policy where we have to distinguish between our friends and our enemies. I mean, the government of Syria, for example, is not our enemy. The government of Russia is not our enemy. The government of Iran is not our enemy. And whatever quarrels they may have with Israel is none of our business. I mean, we should realize that, you know, the Islamists are our enemies. And we should not refuse the help of government that are willing to help us, um, you know, in, in the states. After all, we don't care about human rights when we ally ourselves with Qatar and Saudi Arabia. So, I mean, you know... Uh, the problem is really to distinguish between our real friends and our uh, real enemies. Now, what sort it of It doesn't seem to be, you know, this, I mean, the problem of chaos, the chaos is there. We have to stop it somewhere. I mean, it's too late to say we shouldn't have invaded Iraq. That's true, but we did. And now we are in a new situation. And, and I think it seems to be that the further intervention, which have not been done in the name of the war on terror, but in the name of human rights, namely in Libya and Syria, I've only made the situation even worse. And so I wanted to ask you, is this going to strengthen the, the far right and, uh, you know, right wing political parties in Europe? Obviously, the refugee crisis is uh, a major issue in Europe right now. Um, yes, of because... course, it's going to strengthen them. But of course, you see, the problem is that almost the inter when, when there was a war in Libya, for example, there was a vote in the Belgian parliament. It was absolutely unanimous in favor of the war which means that the far right and the Greens, there was no nothing to the left of the Greens then, uh, you know, they voted all for the war. I mean, there was no dissent. So there's complete unanimity in the political class, in the media and so on, in favor of this humanitarian intervention. I have participated in many debates about the Syrian rebellion. There was for the Syrian rebellion, there still are. There have been a calling, even in France, there have been calling for intervention in Libya. I mean, given this policy, then, of course, the same people now say you have to welcome the refugees. But the people who didn't want those interventions in the first place will say, why do we have to welcome the refugees? What, why is it our fault? Why is it our business? And the left has followed the policy, which I think is completely suicidal, because they have never thought in realistic terms about what the effects are going to be, were going to be of their policies. And the policy of welcoming the refugees, I'm all for welcoming the refugees, but you must realize that at this point, it's totally impossible. And you try to impose it again by using, you know, international treaties and so on, uh, which were violated in the humanitarian wars, but now they invoke these treaties. That's going to make a big rise for the far right. There's no alternative to that because people don't want it. And they never wanted policy of intervention, you see. I mean, there is a problem of this well-meaning left to think that they are going to solve all the problem of the world and they are going to solve them by what? By force not by negotiation, but by strengthening, in the end, you know, the, uh, the CIA and the United States, because these are the only strengths that we have, or maybe some bombing or something. And that's a to total mistake, but this mistake has been prevalent in the left, and by left, I mean the governmental left, the far left, the, everybody, the Greens, I mean, they, they were the more adamant for humanitarian wars. I think there's been a huge mistake, and we have to rethink everything. And of course, it's, they're going to pay a big price. I mean, the refugees are going to be price. The people, people of migrant immigration are going to, uh, you know, people of migrant origin will pay a big price. That's certainly true. 
But the mistake of it made before, one has to think about one, what one does. Well, we want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us at the Real News Network.